So it's a, an exciting time for Resolute. Um, I'll go through, I guess, the automation project. It's a bit small, but anyway. I'll uh, introduce Siama, the uh, gold mine, um, sort of why, why the business decided to automate and then go through what we're doing at Siama in terms of automation, and then just a couple of key factors uh, that probably contributed to the successes that we've currently had in the project, and then uh, the, the future successes that we're expecting to come. So the Siama gold mines in Mali, um, there's obviously a lot of challenges associated with mining in Mali, um, in terms of social license to operate, uh, in terms of logistics, and, and then on top of that, you have all of the, the normal uh, risks associated with mining, like uh, ground control um, and hazardous atmospheres. So the Siama gold mine, we're targeting 300,000 uh, 300, uh, ounces per year. Um, I'm, I'm not really a gold guy, but I know that that's, for us, 2.4 million tonnes per annum. And over the last few months, we've sort of ramped up to around 80 or just over 80% of production. And we're steadily climbing that curve as we bring online the, the sub-level caving operation. At the moment, it's a 14-year mine life, but as you can see between the resources and reserves split, um, there's plenty of scope for growth. And a lot of the time, as with most mines, um, the, the deposit stops where the drilling stops. So. In terms of why the business decided to automate, there's three key reasons why uh, any business should automate. Um, the key one is safety. And um, I'll, I'll delve into the, the safety topic a little bit more. And then the byproducts that are, I guess, add value and, and um, form up the business case generally for a mine is productivity and efficiency. Uh, a key image that whenever I think about automation in mining is, is the image that I'm, I'm showing you now, which is a tag board actually in, in Australia at the North Parks Mine operation, which is a block cave um, in New South Wales. And this is when I was uh, shift bossing there and we transitioned from manual production to uh, fully autonomous mining. Admittedly, this is a night shift. But um, you can see that there's only three tags on the board or three people underground. And this is a mine that delivers you know, 6.4 million tonnes per annum of production. So when you think about the, the mining hazards, like ground control and, and mud rush and, and the like, you're really looking at automation is a way to separate people from hazards. Um, and as an example, in this operation, we had fines, rushes from draw points, um, and a number of other uh, challenges. But even when uh, working through these challenges with the, the regulator in Australia, because you don't expose people to those hazards, it's not really a safety incident. So it's, it's much easier to mine in those conditions when it's really just you're talking potential equipment loss rather than potential life loss. So safety is, is the key driver for automation. And then after that, we get additional production and efficiency. So productivity, which is you know, higher throughput or more tons per hour. Um, we can go through some numbers a little bit later. And then efficiency, which is, I guess, getting more out of the resources that you currently have. So automation at Siama. Siama, I think, uh, when Resolute engaged um, Sandvik and, and chose to go with Sandvik, they, they made the bold step of doing a lot in terms of digitalization and automation all in one go. So automation at Siama includes trucks, loaders, drills, but also sort of a full digitalization package, machine data, um, dashboards, um, and then further down the line, machine learning and the like. So, when I look at Siama I th and look at the industry, I think we're at the cusp of a turning point where this will become normal. Um, but it's probably the most complex automation and, and, and digitalization um, project, I think, to date. So automated drilling, uh, we're currently running three automated uh, production drill rigs. 
unfortunately, it looks like the videos aren't playing out. But anyway, we're, we're running three production drill rigs in automation. And, and what that generally means is that at any given time, there's an operator in the control room essentially monitoring the, the drill rigs and attending to each drill rig depending on what happens underground. Uh, we'll go through the automated drilling is sort of in terms of the life of a sublevel cave. Obviously, drill stocks are, are key to um, ensuring you can progress with the drill and blast cycle and then production. So automated drilling was sort of the key focus for delivery up front. And then as the cave production started, we moved on to loaders and then trucks. So in terms of results and validated results, I'll be able to provide some of, of the results we've had from our drilling automation. And then you'll see, hopefully, some of the other results come through as, as we commission. Automated LHDs, so you can see Awa here. Again, apologies, the, the video is, isn't shown, but um, there's a, I guess this is our, oh, oh, there we go. There was a twitch of a head. But so Awa is um, I guess essentially monitoring um, this LHD, which is, uh, I guess, dumping in automation. Um, and you can see that in, instead of an, an operator having to mechanically control the rig, we're in a control room environment, um, away from the hazards, as we discussed. But then also, the level of interaction required means that one person can control many, uh, many machines. So automated LHDs at the moment, we have a production level with, an automated, with automated LHD equipment, uh, LH517s or a 517 loader, and uh, 514E, an electric loader. And then also the 621, which is our largest loader as well. So generally, we use the LHDs over shift change. So the, the largest productivity boost for us is during shift change and blasting, where when we blast, there's obviously um, hazardous atmosphere, so we need to clear the mine. And that's the key point at which we can arm up the automation system and run over those times where conventional operations would need to have no one underground. So that in itself, you, I mean, you get a kick of you know, between 10 to 20% additional productivity just from the point of view of you've got more productive time. Automated trucks. So this, this video is actually from three days ago. Um, we're commissioning our automated trucking system. And it includes trucks uh, at, a, at a, a tipping arrangement for a loader to tip in. And you can see the Sandvik guys commissioning the, uh, the routes for the, all of the equipment and validating them. And this is just an example on a, a CCTV camera where you can see a automated vehicle backing into a loading bay. And I'll, on, the, on the next slide, you can see the, the precision in which it operates. But we also run the same arrangement in, in manual operations in order to um, test uh, production from the mine. And it is near impossible for a, uh, oh, it's quite dark on the screen. Hopefully the ones on the sides are a little bit easier to see. Um, but it, it's, it's quite difficult for a manual machine to get so close to the, uh, the tipping area and in the same position all the time. Often we find damage to machines on that side of the vehicle because the operator is trying to get close to the wall. So you get tire damage, you get uh, tub damage and the like. This is, this is an example where you can see a machine reversing effectively at full speed and stopping at the same time every time. So even though this is the start of our commissioning uh, for the automated haulage underground, you can see we're, having, well, we're seeing a lot of positive steps uh, where the, the machine stops and starts and runs at full speed all the time. So we've got some pretty high targets in terms of cycle times that we, we want to achieve. But the commissioning that we've done to date has been quite uh, promising um, to display, I guess, the, the promise of what automation will bring to the mine. Not only do we have, have sort of the big machines doing the big production, but we also have a number of sort of unmanned uh, vehicles traveling around underground. So this is an example of a, a small robot 
uh, wirelessly controlled uh, with a laser scanner up top. And essentially this small unit can travel around the mine and also map areas. So in terms of stoping areas where it's, you have unsupported ground or potentially over uh, where you have ha hazardous atmospheres or where you don't want to send a person, it's very easy to deploy a, a, a fairly cost-effective unit like this in order to do that monitoring for you. This um, was a small drone from Australian Droid and Robot. At the same time, we also uh, did some underwater ROV work, um, which was also fairly exciting to just monitor pipelines and the like. So to tie that all together, we have all of these machines underground um, that can operate autonomously. Uh, we have, a, I guess, a state-of-the-art control room facility on surface, which essentially houses all of the controls for all of these machines. So the drills, the loaders, the trucks. Um, and so the, f the function of the, the shift boss really moves from being underground and going around to make sure work is happening and it's happening in the right way to monitoring from the control room. Um, very similar to what happens in uh, all processing facilities where in, in today's day and age you don't really question whether you'll have a control system or you'll have automatic valving in your, your processing facility. Um, it just comes with what you build. And it's, you can see the change starting to happen with automated mining operations where it's, it's no longer really a question of will you automate, it's more you'll, you'll have to automate in order to have these key benefits and it's more choosing what, what bits and pieces of automation and digitalization you're going to use in your system in order to get the most production out of the mine. But with all, um, the, you know, automating a mine, I think um, one of the key learnings is that it's, it's really about the people. And uh, whenever I see this image for the student am among you, you might notice that uh, the gentleman that's on the, on the right is actually doing productive work, and the gentleman that's on the left is actually just a screenshot of a, a, a loader and a truck there. And it's actually the screensaver. And when you're in Mali, you, you still have to deal with all of the, the normal sort of human components. And that's probably the greatest challenge um, when delivering a, a automated uh, solution to any mine. But uh, Awa, who's standing there as, as the shift boss, got promoted to shift boss that day um, in order to stand in. And there was a, a gentleman that wasn't happy that there was a, a lady that would be the boss over them. So he got quickly removed from that seat and uh, we, we, we got someone to step in and start up. But I think the challenges are faced everywhere, but it's, it's interesting to see how the challenges that were underground are just now on surface. <laughs> I um, have a, a story which is generally around moving um, from, a, I guess, an underground mine to a, a surface operation like this, where Operators would often argue and c complain that air conditioners wouldn't work underground in the machine. And then once we move to 100% automation, you get the same sort of arguments with, them, with the air conditioners on the wall. So the same, same problems, just different environment. So the current results. Uh, as I said, the, the most sort of data that we have is from our drilling operations. And uh, we, with the fleet of three draw rigs, and apologies again for the, the size of the text, it actually looks like we, we may not be connected uh, to the internet here. But um, the, the drills achieved in the first month over 21% additional drill meters per day. That's actually a, a, a low number there. In, in terms of month by month, we, we vary between that 21% and then we ramped up to over 34%. So month by month, it varies between 20, 21% and 34% additional drill meters per day. Um, and then I, we, we also have some great references for, against um, accuracy, where we had uh, manual operators using the drill rigs and we were monitoring the drill rigs for, for how they were performing. Uh, we were getting toe deviations that were quite high. And even though you're employing expat drillers and, and bringing them a long way to, to work at your operation, it doesn't generally mean that you're always getting quality. 
So when we implemented the automated drilling system, we got a greater than 10% increase in um, drilling accuracy. And at times, that, that, that number is really, really high. Like we were getting anywhere sometimes to over a metre of toe deviation to up, to up to three to four metres. So the, the key is not only the additional drill metres that you get per day, but you also have repeatable results that you know won't vary based on who, you, who you're employing. Some key milestones or some, some key achievements. We uh, did the most automated hours or we did more automated hours on a DL series rig uh, than anyone in the world. And that, that's obviously continuing as, as those machines continue to drill in automation. And then another key milestone was we, we automated an LHD and a drill at the same time in the same area. So instead of just having LHDs running together, we also had production drill rigs on the same level and LHDs on the same level as well. So sort of multi-machine, but different machines. So automation projects, I sort of got asked, like, what are the, some of the key things that you can provide in terms of the, the, to, to make automation a success? And I think most of the time it's fairly common sense, so I don't think any of this is groundbreaking. But the key one, I think, is the team. And um, although this is a, a picture of the automation team for Siama, um, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of fun. Uh, Joe, sort of my boss, um, who uh, implemented the system at North Parks and then here at Siama, sort of pulled myself and Jack, Jack Moen, into, uh, into this project. And without, I guess, being able to have a solid team and to be able to lean on each other, in order to get the work done, uh, no, nothing happens. But broader than just the, the team that's delivering the, the solution and engaging with Sandvik in order to do that is the business as well. And the business, you, you, you get all sorts of people across the business that believe in automation, believe in digitalization, and then you have the people that just don't, don't really see the value. Um, but it's, it's quite positive to be in a business where straight from the top, um, from, from CEO level, you know that you're a priority in the business and the business sees value in the operation. So core to delivering any, any sort of automated solution to the business is really having, having that support across the business in order to get the work done. Uh, one of the, the sort of left field, but people often from the mining industry get a little bit surprised um, because people are used to the, the shiftly communications, the, day sh the, you know, the handover at shift change. You're working a roster and you come in and you get a handover from your cross shift. Um, you, know, you only get little tidbits of information when you're away from site. Um, our team, and I guess um, we, we were given a lot of flexibility to do what we, we wanted to do in, t in terms of managing how we were going to deliver the automation component of the project. And we chose a number of tools in order to help us be agile, help us communicate, and also keep a transparency between what we were doing, um, what Sandvik were doing in Finland, and then also across our business. So we chose sort of Atlassian and, and Confluence, Jira, and then Slack as sort of our communications platform in order to provide, a, I guess, a, a range of tools, but I guess a cloud-based solution in order to keep everyone on the same page. And while I think this is actually a really normal part of doing business in, uh, in software and, and some other industries, in the mining industry, it's great to see you know, integration of these sorts of tools into the way we do business. As an example, um, we, we implemented JIRA for our issue tracking and sort of project management um, framework and tool. And we could work with the team in Finland to deliver products and at, in real time they can engage with an issue and everybody across the, the business is getting the updates. So the team in Perth in Australia has the same Kanban board on their screens. The team in Siama has the same board in there um, at the mine. And the team in Finland has the exact same board. And as we transition through solving issues and encountering issues, everybody sort of walks the same road and the same path as we go. Similarly, Slack, we, um, we, we do a, a lot of work through Slack and it, 
I guess the integration between all these tools is what makes it work really well. But just the sheer um, benefit of your project director or your CEO being able to see your, your daily news. Um, and then when you ask for something or when an issue comes up, everybody always has all of the information at their fingertips. Or if someone's walking into a meeting, they have all of the context to go into that meeting. And if they don't, they can quickly look it up anywhere in the world. So um, I can't really stress enough how when you, it's, it's a large, complex project involving teams across the world, uh, how important it is to make sure that we're, we're open with our communication and everybody has the information at hand. So that was a great decision and it's definitely something that both Sandvik um, are looking at implementing further with their, their next customer engagements. It's something that we're rolling across um, other facets of our, our projects team and business. And then we've had a number of other people who've been involved with the project sort of decide that, you know, the, the, the tools that the software industry uses in order to have high cycle time and throughput are, are probably good tools to have in the minus, mining industry as well. So one of the other key, uh, I guess, areas of focus or key um, insights to success, I think, is the same as, as everywhere else. Um, there's this it's easy to have a plan, and I, I guess everybody goes to OEMs and says, oh, we want automation, what do we need? But behind all of that, a business really needs to have a, key, a, a clear strategy. And even though the plan might change, um, having some core principles or some core values behind that strategy become really important in order to allow you to pivot and, and really become, um, or uh, expose the business to, to that growth that we're seeing from the technology sector. So some of the key ones, which again, you know, are, are sort of pretty um, popular within the, 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 the programming world or, or the software space is keeping your technology open and keeping information open. And we've touched on this in this talk already where giving everybody the information makes it really easy to bring everyone with you but also make decisions. Um, providing people with open data access within your business and even with, with the people that you're working with really allows people to be curious and find um, improvements with you. Modular, so it's, it's incredibly important in, in an industry that changes so quickly to be able to sort of plug and play components of the system. So you may have a wireless communic communication system and a Sandvik loader or a, you know, an Epiroc loader or whatever it is, but it's important to be able to be able to plug and play, say, your communication system, or be able to plug and play your um, control system on that, on that piece of equipment so that you can improve and trial new things. And a key one for planning is making sure that it, whatever the solution is, that it's scalable. So whenever you deliver something, it's outdated and it's incredibly important I mean, the business will always want to achieve more throughput, more tons per hour, uh, or higher efficiency. And so choosing technologies that allow you to scale um, as, as the business demands more of it becomes incredibly important after you deliver the project. Oh, that's the end of the slides. Apologies, a, technical presenta or a, a technology presentation with technical issues. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, are there any questions? <laughs>